Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Marine Money Virtual Monaco event. I'm your host, John Chair, and I'm glad to be hosting today's event as there's a lot of incredible content to review and discussions to be had. Today, the first session will cover the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and how what impact it has had on high net worth individuals and also the luxury and super yacht market. Following that educational piece, we will dive into a panel discussion at around about 10.30 with a star-studded team around legal, tax and regulatory factors that are affecting the super yacht market at this moment. To kick off this first session, we have Michael Phillips, who is the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at WealthX. Michael has over 15 years of experience developing go-to-market strategies, both for business-to-business -business, uh, companies and for business-to-consumer organizations. With an emphasis on thought leadership, product and executive positioning, and reputational management. Prior to WealthX, Michael had a senior position at HL Group Rubenstein, where he advised a variety of luxury clients. Today, Michael is here to help take us through the world of ultra high net worth individuals, the state of the luxury market, and impacts this has had on the super yacht market. Now, before I hand it over to uh, Michael for this webinar, the audience will be put on mute to ensure audio quality control. During this webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to the panelists and to Michael. This is the whole reason we do this live, so please take advantage of this. And I know that Michael loves a, you know, a few hard questions. Uh, to ask a question, simply enter your question in the text box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions, like shown on my screen. I will receive them, and at the end of the session, I'll ask them on your behalf. So there's no silly questions. Finally, if you want to collapse your menu to see the fantastic talent we have today, simply click on the orange slash red box with the arrow on it, and that should cla collapse the menu. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Michael to take it away. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Marine Money, for giving me an opportunity to pull a shirt off of a hanger instead of out of a, a drawer today. Uh, something that's a, a rare commodity in, in today's world. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, and the first thing you'll probably notice if you signed up for this uh, presentation more than a day ago is that I am not uh, Manuel Bianchi, my colleague who is meant to speak here today. Uh, Manuel is uh, a brand new father as of Sunday. Uh, and we wish him and his family who are all doing well, tremendous congratulations. So um, uh, I'm happy to fill in, uh, not quite the uh, luxury expert that he is, but uh, I hope to do it justice. Um, so with that, uh, next slide, please. So taking a look at our agenda today, we're gonna look first at some research from um, two recent reports that we published. They're actually our two most recent reports, the World Ultra Wealth Report, uh, the eighth edition of this report we uh, released earlier in October. This report focuses specifically on the ultra wealthy population around the world. Uh, we uh, consider ultra wealthy individuals those with $30 million or more in net worth. Um, the second piece of research that we'll be taking a look at is um, our Global Luxury Outlook, which was released at the end of August. Uh, this was a brand new report for us. It focuses on the wider wealthy population and their relationship to um, every aspect of luxury. Um, and from there, we'll take a look at uh, who WealthX is, uh, what we do, how we do it, um, and why we do it. So, and then hopefully we'll have uh, some time for, for some of those hard questions that John mentioned right after that. Uh, next slide, please. So, Let's take a look first at where we landed at the end of 2019 with the ultra high net worth population. Um, all of our world ultra wealth reports typically look at the year prior. It gives us a full year of data to look at uh, and we can really mark growth, decline um, or anything in between doing it that way. So the at the end of 2019, we saw um, the largest growth ever in the ultra high net worth population around the world. We had just shy of 300,000 individuals, just a, a little over 290. Uh, and that was a 9.5% increase, almost a 10% increase over the previous year in 2018. Uh, similarly, this population's wealth grew in lockstep. Uh, over three, uh, $35 trillion, uh, that was a 9.7 increase over the previous year. So. Uh, 2019 was a great year for this population in terms of growing, 
generating wealth. And you can see by looking at the, uh, the map below that it wasn't uh, specific just to one or two even uh, geographic locations. Every region around the world saw growth. Now, um, regions like North America and Asia saw uh, pretty significant growth. North, North America had uh, over 14% increase in population and wealth um, in 2019. Uh, Asia had just over 10%. Um, but even the regions that didn't see the same uh, heightened wealth did see an increase. So the Middle East, which had the lowest increase, uh, was 0.7%, uh, uh, as well as Latin America and the Caribbean uh, had just over uh, 2% or close to 3% growth, I, I should say, uh, in population and in wealth. Next slide, please. Given that 2020 is a year unlike any other, I think we can all agree that uh, agree with that. It is. It dawned on us as we started planning for this year's World Ultra Wealth Report that we couldn't approach it as we had in previous years. So whereas we usually take a look at the previous year and compare things year over year, uh, it would be remiss of us not to talk about 2020 and do some, some research into what's happening with this population. Um, we found that in the first three months, of 2020, there was an 18% decline in the ultra high net worth population by the end of March. Um, that's a pretty significant drop. Um, that's due to the economic fallout from the pandemic, uh, the uh, from stock markets and global economies, and just the uncertainty um, all around the world, specifically at that time. However, when we look towards the end of August, we find that that wealth and that population has rebounded just to negative 3% from where it was at the end of 2019, uh, meaning it's gone up and it's uh, rebounded 15% from March to the end of August. Uh, and this speaks to um, what a lot of economists are talking about right now with that uh, K-shaped recovery in the sense that the um, individuals who were the wealthiest are seeing their wealth come back prior to those uh, in lower tiers of wealth. Um, so that's that's something important to keep in mind for luxury brands, especially going forward, that a lot of the wealth at this level has been recuperated. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more going forward about uh, propensity to spend uh, and invest that money. Next slide, please. So taking a little bit more of a granular look into this rebound that we just talked about, um, we look at it over regions, similarly to what we did at the end of 2019 with that growth. Um, and we see here that really all regions, just like last year, are rebounding, um, some stronger than others, specifically North America and Asia, but um, there isn't a, uh, a region here that hasn't had a rebound. And I know that this is probably a little bit hard to read, and, and I know that people might be scribbling, maybe hopefully scribbling <laughs> some furious notes down based on this research. Um, I just wanted to say that all of our reports are available on our website to download for free. Um, and I will uh, plug that, uh, that link a little bit later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. So this information is from our Global Luxury Outlook. I mentioned before, this is the first year we've produced this report that really focuses on the wealthiest relationship with the luxury sector, uh, which is, is truly interwoven. Uh, and we took a look back pretty deep. Uh, we know that the global millionaire population, meaning those with $1 million or more, so we're zooming out a little bit on this when we talk about the wealthy, excuse me, um, doubled over the 2005 to 2009 period to uh, over 25 million individuals, it's a pretty significant number of, of folks out there. Uh, this increase was propelled by uh, strong economic growth in Asia. Uh, as well as continued urbanization, and of course, uh, transform transformative advances in digitization. Uh, when you think about where we were from a digital perspective and how um, individuals at all tiers of wealth accessed uh, purchasing and uh, communications in 2005, uh, when I don't even think I had a MySpace account, uh, versus now, uh, it's a pretty tremendous change um, over the course of 15 years. Um, this was also um, a period of unprecedented liquidity from global central bank banks, which really gave uh, those with wealth, those who are high net worth or ultra wealthy, um, the opportunity to spend. Um, so the global luxury market expanded from um, 147 billion euro in 2005 to 1.3 trillion 
euro in 2019. And you can see that um, somewhere between 2014 and 2015, um, this population and the global luxury market crisscrossed um, so that there's uh, a high, higher amount of spend than uh, the number of folks, which means, and we continue that, we can expect to see that lockstep that you see from 2015 onward to continue. Next slide, please. Another asset from our global luxury outlook, we um, create archetypes based on the information in our global database. And we're able to look at the key traits amongst different types of individuals. So for the luxury sector, we decided to compare side by side um, ultra wealthy. So we're back focused on those with $30 million or more um, ultra wealthy jet owners yacht owners and art collectors. Um, looking at some key distinctions amongst ultra high net worth yacht owners, we see that over 90% are age 50 and older, uh, nearly 90% are male. Um, one thing that's interesting is that over two thirds are self-made. So um, when we look at the key differences between self-made wealthy individuals versus those who have inherited their wealth, um, self-made individuals feel probably off, more often more entitlement to their wealth and want to feel more entitled to spend it. Uh, they also want to make a name for themselves. They're likely not living on any sort of legacy the way that someone who inherited their wealth has. Um, so what does their profile look like? They're highly thinking about that. And I think everybody on this call can likely agree that there's nothing uh, that uh, speaks more than owning a yacht, right? Uh, you may take your jet from one point to another. Uh, you may take it to get to your yacht. Um, but you can live on your yacht. You can thrive on your yacht. You can be your escape. It can be your home. Uh, you can host your art collection on your yacht. So um, it's no surprise there that two thirds are uh, self-made. Um, it's probably also no surprise that amongst these three uh, characterizations the, that uh, yacht owners have the highest average net worth at um, $510 million on average. Uh, next slide, please. Another aspect of the global luxury outlook, uh, we were able to interview some um, clients and references of ours who are experts in the luxury industry. And we were able to pull out three key trends that we're seeing um, across the industry right now. Um, the first is a move toward intangible luxury, and uh, that's an increase in demand for assets like passports, citizenships, uh, on-demand healthcare. Um, I think it's uh, pretty common knowledge at this point that security, flexibility, uh, the ability to travel uh, right now, more so than ever, are all very rare commodities. So if you have the wealth to invest, uh, that's probably gonna be at the top of your list in terms of where you wanna invest it. Um, we also pulled out uh, the concept that private luxury is here to stay. Um, we're all especially private right now. We're all hopefully at home or someplace safe. Um, and the wealthy want luxury brought to them more so than ever. And uh, a lot of uh, luxury organizations have, uh, have answered that call, um, bringing services, goods, experiences to their clients rather than having them go seek it. Um, so luxury service at home is something that is increasing and will continue to increase. Um, once it becomes commonplace, you know, because of the pandemic, folks might not want to do it uh, outside of their home ever again. So um, there's also the concept of a second home. And obviously when we're talking about this level of wealth, most individuals do own a second home, uh, if not a third and fourth. But, um, you know, I think that when you are at home all day uh, with your spouse, maybe your kids are learning remotely, having a second or third home is, is a, a commodity you're willing to invest in. Um, and the third trend that we see is uh, a continued growth of online distribution. And uh, I, I spoke about this in the last slide, or two slides ago, I should say, with the, the increased digitization that we've seen since 2005. And um, there are luxury organizations of all walks that are increasing their digital footprint. Um, you know, there are certainly the pioneers in the space, like the Moda Operandis of the world. But I think that for those organizations that might've been shy to uh, warm up to that, that might've been more traditional, this situation that we're in, this pandemic has really uh, moved the needle where it's not just a nice to have or something that we're thinking about for the future, but it's something that we need to do now. 
Um, so I think we're going to see more of that. Uh, and I think that uh, luxury, luxury organizations um, are already making that pivot across the board if, if they haven't already. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one final piece of research to consider here when uh, for any organization, uh, luxury or otherwise, who are considering uh, uh, engaging with the ultra wealthy at this time, um, there is an opportunity to spend here. So part of the World Ultra Wealth Report is uh, one thing that we do is a breakdown of asset allocation amongst this population. So how do they hold their wealth and what does that say about them and what does that mean for you? Um, so here we see that amongst the ultra wealthy, 6.1%, um, only 6.1% uh, of their wealth is held in real estate and luxury assets. That's by far the smallest slice of the pie here. Um, the other thing that's worth noting here is that we know that liquidity uh, amongst these individual rises in times of uncertainty. Uh, and you can see that liquidity, the, the blue slice of the pie is the largest. So um, there is an opportunity with this liquidity uh, to engage wealthy individuals who might want to take this time to make an investment. Um, and as we said before, with the themes of privatization, uh, freedom, uh, flexibility, um, certainly yachting falls into that category. So um, I think that there's a, a pretty big opportunity here to engage this population at this time. Uh, next slide, thank you. So that was a little bit about um, two, our two of our most recent reports, the World Ultra Wealth Report, the Global Luxury Outlook. Um, you can download all of our reports on our website, which is wealthx.com. Uh, there's an insight section you'll see right when you get to the page that has all of our reports. If you're not familiar with us, if you're not familiar with these reports, I definitely encourage you to do so. Um, and I'll share contact information at the end that you can also obviously feel free to reach out and we will um, hook you up with the reports themselves. Um, so now that I've showed you some of the research, uh, where does this research come from? Who are we? So WealthX was founded in 2010. Uh, so we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary. Again, weird, weird year to do so, but we're, we're happy to be here. Uh, we serve over 500 clients around the world. Uh, we help them to understand and engage with their target audience, uh, the wealthy, uh, to make more informed decisions when engaging with them and to minimize risk when uh, engaging with these individuals. Uh, we like to think that most of our, our clients uh, enjoy working with us. We boast a 96% renewal rate. Um, and uh, we reach over 180 countries around the world. And um, while we are speaking to luxury today, it's important also to note that we also work with organizations in financial services, the nonprofit and higher education sectors. Next slide, please. Oh, I think we skipped two maybe. Yeah, back one. Yeah. Um, so, our focus, if you probably gathered from, from me talking and presenting this, this research, uh, is the wealthy. But what does that mean in terms of the wealth pyramid? And while we do uh, produce research that takes into account those with between one and five million dollars, it's more as a, a reference point to the two higher tiers of wealth. The very high net worth individuals, those worth between five million and thirty million dollars, uh, that's two point seven million people around the world, uh, and the ultra high net worth population, which is two hundred ninety seven, uh, two hundred ninety one rather, uh, ultra wealthy individuals around the world worth thirty million or more. Um, the reason why we focus uh, on five million and above is is that we find that that's really the threshold. When you get to uh, five million dollars, individuals start to become less and less apt to engage with traditional uh, engagement methods. So, uh, for the luxury space, that might be traditional advertising, um, events, that kind of stuff. Uh, for not the nonprofit space, for example, it might be uh, that they're not responding to grassroots campaigns. They want to be uh, the more wealth that is accrued, the higher up this pyramid you go, the more individuals want to be uh, and expect to be treated uh, in a one-to-one -one bespoke, uh, very tailored approach. So uh, five million or more in net worth is where we make that distinction, but obviously it becomes more and more distinct as you climb that uh, pyramid. 
Um, and we are an end-to-end -end client lifecycle intelligence platform. So we work with clients to not only understand these populations, but really to uh, be able to identify uh, how they can engage with these folks and, and implement this data into their general outreach business strategy. Uh, we, our unique approach also includes a few key points. The first is that uh, we have international data. Uh, we're the, we're the only one amongst our competitors to do so. Uh, we also have uh, daily updates, news alerts, and we not only focus on these individuals, but we put a high premium on their networks. So who are their connections? What are their associations? How do you build your network based on that? Um, next slide, please. So all of our database is made up of the of WealthX dossiers. Uh, what goes into a WealthX dossier? Well, um, a lot, frankly. It is uh, each dossier has uh, relatively uh, a number of fields, uh, over 102 distinct fields. Uh, they're compiled by our global team of researchers from thousands of sources, uh, both paid and unpaid. Uh, they're compiled over 100% open source data. And every piece of data that we include in a WealthX dossier is verified by at least two public sources. So uh, we're, we're confident in that piece of data that we're putting in um, to a dossier before uh, it's released to our clients. Um, our global research team that sits all over the world makes over 230,000 updates uh, per week to these dossiers. So we try to keep the uh, database as fresh as possible. Uh, and that research team speaks well over 30 languages. Actually, I think uh, this slide needs to be updated. It's probably closer to 40 at this point uh, because we want to make sure we're getting as much, um, capturing as much of, a, of a, an audience as possible. Um, and these dossiers include a number of in-depth insights from financial profile to career history, known associates, that's what I mentioned with that network, that's important before, uh, philanthropic endeavors so that you can understand not only where their passions lie, but how much they tend to give, which can be a great indicator of how much they can spend, um, as well as their passions, hobbies, and interests, which gives insight into what drives them. And that's how you can create that bespoke, highly tailored strategy uh, to get their attention, to get in front of them. Next slide, please. Um, so how can you access this? We have a few data access points. WealthX Professional is our online uh, product uh, that we, we build and maintain and update, um, and it accesses our database. Uh, for those who want to integrate our data more into their own environments, we have the WealthX Salesforce application. So our data uh, is basically overlaid into your Salesforce CRM system if you use Salesforce so that you can see our data alongside yours as you are keeping records of the individuals that you work with. Um, and last but not least, we also offer a tailored API integration. So this is a product that uh, the sky is really the limit. If you uh, would like to have a feed of WealthX data into your existing uh, sales and CRM system, we will work with you. Uh, and get creative and create exactly what you need for success. Um, and then we have a few on-demand products as well. The first is WealthX Screening. So if you have um, a database, let's say you are a theater company and you sell tickets every year uh, and you have a database of, of ticket sales, uh, you might know that an individual has spent $200 a year for the past two years on theater tickets, but that they have the capacity to have a seasonal box uh, and they love opera and they might want to come and, and meet with the latest soprano. So uh, that kind of information can be uncovered in your existing data by screening it against the WealthX database. Uh, we also offer a due diligence uh, product, which I mentioned before, which is essentially um, a, a ramped up version of our dossiers that, that really provide an inside look into any risk factors that might come along with an individual that you're seeking to do business with, uh, just to make sure that there's no pending litigation, uh, nothing uh, unsavory in their background that might cause you or your organization uh, a crisis in the future. And last but not least, WealthX Analytics, uh, which speaks to the research that we covered at the beginning portion of this. Um, if any of that research is interesting to you and you thought to yourself, well, I'd really like to know exactly what's happening in Monaco. I'd really like to know exactly what's happening in Miami. Our WealthX Analytics team can work with you to create market sizing reports, um, archetyping reports that uh, provide that very detailed level of information that your organization might need um, to succeed. Um, and with that, next slide, I'm happy to take any questions. I, I think we still have a few minutes. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to type that into the question box right now. But 
to begin with, we have one that has popped in that is, as the coronavirus pandemic continues, do you expect the global wealthy population to decline again? Um, that's a great question. And if I could answer that with certainty, I probably wouldn't be here, but I, um, it's, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I think that's what everybody's wondering. I mean, I think we can speculate that history will repeat itself. I think there's a lot of things going on globally right now and a lot of factors, um, uh, at play, but I think what is most important to recognize is that, um, this group of individuals, uh, maintains their wealth in a way that is is pretty resilient even if it does take a steep dive so um i i would say that regardless of what happens it, it's it should continue to recover okay we have we had a question come in that was a, relevant, a little bit more targeted and it would be interesting to hear what you said is the wealth in russia growing we know that you had your map up earlier but i don't remember exactly the specifics around russia yeah so um the map prior that I showed prior was a regional map. So Russia was included uh, in Europe as part of that. Um, I'd be happy to uh, confer with our team to get the numbers specifically for Russia, if that's something we can share. So uh, if that person who asked that wants to follow up, happy to do what we can. Fantastic. And then there's another question that final, probably the final question that, because we have to move on to the panel discussion, but you know, you kind of discussed about the private, uh, pri kind of private um, uh, wealth. It seems uh, the question is: Are ultra wealthy getting worried about world instability, retreating in privacy? Question mark. I think that pr prior to the pandemic, there was always a trend towards uh wealthy individuals specifically on ultra wealthy individuals uh wanting to have more options and more options includes more security so whether that's a home in a different country um, whether that's a yacht uh, private aviation um, those uh assets not only provide um freedom and, and and flexibility in a joyous way but they also provide security um i think we're all feeling uh you know a sense of urgency around that i think that this you know i Again, it's, uh, uh, you know, I feel like I'm beating a drum, but it's unprecedented times. And I think that if you have the means to be able to cope with that and to be able to plan around that, you will likely do so. Okay, great. And maybe one more kind of geo question is, as we see China, you know, continuing to grow economically, uh, do you believe that there'll be large yacht, sorry, large super yacht sales to China, like an increase? Uh, possibly. I mean, I think that there is, um, I think with China, um, and I don't have this research in front of me, but a few years back we had looked into this, that it wasn't as, um, and it's probably five years now, it wasn't as popular of an asset to purchase in China amongst the wealthy as in uh, the US and the UK uh, and, and generally in Europe. Um, I'm not sure how that's evolved. Um, but as wealth grows in China, as the number of wealthy people grow and you kind of have different personalities and, and certainly there is a, a framework to what being a multimillionaire or a billionaire looks like on paper, uh, I'd say that there's there's likely an opportunity there. Great, and then just to kind of like, like if you could just surmise, what are your thoughts with regards to super yachts moving forward? What do you think that the, the market will do just in general as a kind of a summary for those on the call? Yeah, I mean, I don't, um, again, I, this is where it's like a little bit tricky because I'm not a super yacht expert as I'm filling in for Manuel, but I think that um, if the trends of, that we're seeing right now of privatization, flexibility, um, and security continue, then those, and, and if the, the wealth continues to rebound, um, I would say that there's, there's a pretty big pipeline there for organizations to, to access the people, to appeal to individuals who don't have a yacht that might just want to have that. Um, it's, it's flexibility, it's freedom, but I, I think right now it's also safety and security. Great. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for standing in for Manuel. Um, yeah. That was a tall ask. Um, so <laughs> if anybody has any further questions, feel free to reach out to Michael. You see his details on the screen there. Um, but now we're going to move on to the panel discussion. So uh, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. We'll see you later.